Welcome to the Freak Show, fellow freaks. I'm Matthew Brockmeyer. I'm Krista Carmen. And this is... Murder Coaster. The ghosts that we imagine are often nothing compared to the true monsters standing right before us. While our imaginations conceive of supernatural horrors and the fear of ghosts, goblins, and demons can keep us up at night, it is cold, hard reality that we should be scared of. For monsters are very, very real. And they look just like us. Step right up, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and hear one of the strangest stories you'll ever hear. A tale that defies both logic and imagination. A tale too weird to be true, but true it is, and terribly, terribly tragic as well, ending in senseless murders and horrific brutality. So keep your hands and feet in the ride as we plunge into the story of Daniel LaPlante, a ghost in the walls. Let's begin. Act One, Tina and the Ouija Board. In 1985, the Bowens were a happy family living on 93 Lawrence Street in the small town of Pepperell, Massachusetts. Frank, the dad, was the manager of a hotel restaurant. It was a long commute, and often he'd have to work extra hours and double shifts, not arriving home until late in the night. So mostly it was Mom and the two daughters, Tina and Karen, at the house. Mama Bear and her cubs. The three had a special bond. They'd all eat dinner together, talk about school and all the drama of the day. They were a real team. It was a tiny town, and there wasn't much to do, but the two sisters managed to keep themselves busy. 14-year-old Tina loved her 8-year-old sister Karen and would take her to the historic Lawrence Library to see Sidney M. Shattuck's stuffed birds, or they'd go to the movies and see Back to the Future. In the summer, they'd ride their bikes from one end of town to the other, visiting friends, finding swimming holes. And in the cold winter months, as the snow piled up outside, they'd play Milton Bradley board games like Mousetrap and Battleship, or sit in their basement and watch cable TV. Lying on their bellies next to each other, chins propped on their palms, drinking new Coke, watching different strokes in the Jetsons, and countless hours of MTV, videos of Madonna, culture club and tears for fears the girls were excited because a brand new shopping mall was about to open just over the border in neighboring new hampshire called the pheasant lane mall where they'd be able to get all the latest fashion like esprit benetton and jordache jeans but tina also had an independent streak She loved horses and had a part-time job mucking out stalls at the nearby Thoroughbred Breeding Farm on the weekends. She also loved roller skating and would go to the local roller rink on Saturday nights with her best friend Kathleen Knapp and flirt with boys, often giving them her phone number. Like all the really cool kids at the time, she had her own landline phone in her bedroom. In the days before the internet, this is how kids communicated and interacted. Landlines. And Tina felt very special to have her own, where she could talk uninterrupted for hours. Yeah, you know, in some ways, the internet is like MTV and landlines smashed together. (laughs) (laughs) And an astute observation and very true. Also, I used to have a landline, but I would unplug it and hide it under my bed because I could not talk uninterrupted for hours. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes little Karen could be bratty and demand Tina let her in her room to hear what she was talking about, or play with her makeup. And sometimes Tina could be mean to her little sister, and tell her to get out, or slam the door in her face. But in the end, Karen always ended up at Tina's side, emulating her big sister, and Tina would include her, 
the two sisters dancing about as Wham's Wake Me Up Before You Go-Go, a personal favorite, if you must know, played on the wobbly record player. Jitterbug. Snap. Snap. (laughs) Often Tina's best friend, Kathleen, would be there for sleepovers, and the three girls would spend hours feathering and fluffing each other's hair, getting it as big as possible, crimping it, then painting on thick baby blue eyeshadow, bubblegum-flavored lip gloss, preening in the mirror like Madonna. But then, tragedy struck the sweet little family. Their mother was diagnosed with cancer and quickly succumbed to the dreaded disease and died. The girls were obviously devastated. Their mother had been the pillar of their family, their support, The girls felt lost without her, rudderless on a dangerous sea. They were deeply, deeply grieving. And suddenly Tina was thrust into the role of care provider for the family, responsible for making sure little Karen got to school in the morning and did her homework. She had to provide dinner and get all the dishes put away afterwards, do the laundry, take out the trash. She was basically now the mom of the family. At only 14 years old. Frank did the best he could. He understood the enormous pressure that was suddenly put on Tina. But he had to work, had to provide for the family. And that often meant him being gone all day and long into the night. There were no weekends off for a restaurant manager. In fact, weekends and holidays were some of the busiest times. But together, they found an answer. Tina's best friend, Kathleen Knapp's parents were moving to Tennessee, and Kathleen did not want to go. She lived in Pepperell all her life. All her friends were there. The thought of moving on to a new town in the South, going to a new school and having to make new friends, it just didn't sit well with her. What if Kathleen could stay there in Pepperell, living with the Bowens and helping Tina with the household responsibilities? Kathleen and Tina were more than best friends. They were already like sisters, and Karen felt the same way. Kathleen could also be there as a friend and shoulder to cry on for both Tina and Karen, as both the sisters were still terribly upset and grieving over the loss of their mother. Everyone agreed, and Frank even signed papers, making him Kathleen's custodian. Kathleen moved in, and the three girls became an inseparable unit, soul sisters. Frank even got Kathleen her own landline and phone as well. The girls could call each other from their own rooms. But Frank really didn't know what he'd gotten himself into, as the girls could be pretty wild, staying up all night, playing records, and talking to God knows who on the phone. And when Tina turned 15, she went even more, in her own words, boy crazy than she'd been before. She'd be constantly flirting. Once at the laundromat washing the family clothes with Kathleen and Karen, she saw a bunch of really cute boys milling around outside. So she went up into the large open window and did a little Madonna dance to attract their attention. Which it did. She gave them all her phone number and thought nothing of it. But that was just the way of life back then. It was all very innocent, even wholesome in a weird way. Just watch some John Hughes movies that show what it was like to be a teenager in the 80s. Or maybe don't, because some of them are deeply problematic by today's standards, like 16 Candles, which I love, but I'm going to sound like a really old man and just say, it was a much simpler time back then. (laughs) Uh, Though the girls were having a ball, hitting the roller skating rink in the movie theater, riding their bikes all over town, basically free to do whatever they wanted. There was a deep hole in Tina's heart where her mother had been. She was still deeply grieving, and she needed guidance. She was coming into womanhood, hormones raging. She needed a mother to talk to, not a dad or even a friend or a sister, but a mother with wisdom and understanding. She felt so lost with her mom gone. If only she could talk to her just one last time. So Kathleen and Tina came up with an idea. A seance. They would hold a seance and try to contact Tina's mother from beyond the grave. The teenage girls would reach through the veil of the living and the dead 
and speak with her just one last time so that Tina could get the closure she needed, hear any last advice her mother wished to impart, so they could say their goodbyes. Amongst all the boxes of board games in the closet, jammed between Monopoly and Clue, was a Ouija board set. Solemnly, the two teenagers pulled the box free and headed to the depths of the basement, a dark place, literally within the bowels of the earth, that seemed perfect to reach out to the dead. They laid a blanket on the floor, gathered candles and placed them about, then lit them one by one. Kathleen flipped off the lights, and now the basement was nothing but darkness, save for the circle of flickering candles. They sat cross-legged across from each other. The box was opened, and the Ouija board unfolded and lay between them, the dark letters against the bone-pale board. The girls grasped hands and closed their eyes, and Kathleen began to speak an incantation. Keepers of the veil, we wish to reach out to the other side to make contact with those who have moved on from this world. We wish to speak to the dead. The basement was incredibly silent and still, an emptiness that seemed almost hum in silence. <laughs> that makes no sense, but whatever. That's a fun word sound. I like it. I don't know. <laughs> Thanks. The girls released their intertwined fingers and opened their eyes, gazing at each other in the candlelight and giggling awkwardly for a moment before casting their gaze down to the heart shaped planchette that, when the spirit entered the room, would slide across the slick board to spell out letters and answer yes or no to questions. The two girls gently placed their fingertips onto the planchette, and Tina, breathing in deep, readied herself to talk with her dead mother. Mom, she asked, her voice cracking, then stronger, asking again. Mom, Mom, are you there? From within the darkness, there was a wrenching sound. And suddenly the metal door to the fuse box banged open, went flying off its hinges, and went whipping across the basement, slamming into the opposite wall with a bang. The two girls gasped, then screamed in terror, leaping to their feet and racing up the stairs out of the basement. Upstairs, Tina grabbed Kathleen. Did you do that? No, I swear, did you? No! They were both trembling. What had just happened? Could they have possibly reached the ghost of Tina's mother? Or something else? That night, as Tina lay in bed, she heard something beneath her. Coming from the basement. A very, very soft thump. Two in a row. Thump, thump. Then again. Barely perceptible, like a muffled heartbeat. Thump, thump. And again, moving slowly across the floor, and then up the wall. Thump, 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 thump. She wondered, could it be her mother? It didn't feel like her mother. She wanted to call out. Is that you, Mommy? Are you there? Do you miss us? Do you still love us? But she dared not speak, scared of the sound, not wanting to provoke it. When the girls woke up in the morning and stumbled to the kitchen for their boxes of Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch, they looked out the window into the backyard to see the shed doors somehow open and everything from the shed thrown about the backyard. Rakes and shovels and lawn chairs, beach umbrellas, the croquet set, sprawled out everywhere as if thrown by a malevolent force, vomited out. They'd seen The Exorcist and other horror movies. They knew playing with a Ouija board or having a seance could be a way of inviting a demon into your house. And they were deathly afraid. They told Tina's father what they'd done and about the contents of the shed. 
Frank told them to stop being ridiculous. Ouija boards, ghosts, and demons. He saw this as a cry for attention from Tina and demanded that she actually go see a grief counselor. She was obviously still traumatized from the death of her mother and needed psychological help. And as far as the shed in the backyard, neighborhood kids had obviously been the culprits. And he'd see to them when he found out which ones were up to it. That's for sure. But the knocking continued, coming at strange times from out of nowhere. Karen heard it too and grew very frightened. Only nine years old, looking to her older sister and her best friend for protection. And other things were happening too. The television or radio would turn on in another room, or the channel would change mysteriously. Food would often go missing. But then it would all stop. For weeks at a time, there'd be nothing at all, not a peep, and the three girls would think it was over. But then it would all start back. The gentle knocks turning into violent bangs. Chairs turned over. It was becoming utterly terrifying and nerve-wracking and frustrating. The poltergeist was taunting them. One afternoon, watching television in the living room, the three girls heard a banging in the basement and decided to investigate. Tina grabbed a pink baseball bat, opened the cellar door, and shouted down, Whatever or whoever's down there, we're not scared of you! But the truth was, They were very afraid. The three of them crept down the basement steps, Tina in the lead, little Karen huddled in fear behind her, clutching her sweatshirt, and Kathy behind, a little unit. They searched all over the basement, but found nothing amiss, nothing strange, nothing at all. Then one night, there was an electrical storm. Rain was pounding against the windows, thunder crashing so close the house shook. And suddenly Tina heard Kathy screaming uncontrollably Ah, ah, ah. and ran to her. Kathy struggled to speak, panting and weeping, but finally managed to say that she'd been walking through the dark kitchen when lightning had struck filling the room with instantaneous white light for a moment. And she'd seen Tina's mother in the corner, a cloaked figure, stooped and wretched, before she disappeared into the darkness. Then the haunting stopped again. Nearly a month passed without a single knock or bang on the walls. Life went on. Little Karen got seriously sick and was home from school, and Tina decided to play nurse and stay home with her, take care of her little sister. The two girls were laying in Tina's bed, watching the prices right together, when suddenly the radio in the kitchen came blaring on, and the cabinet doors began to open and slam violently. Tina felt trapped there, trying to protect her sister while some kind of dark force was going crazy in the kitchen. She grabbed the phone and frantically called her father at work. Now, it's lunchtime, and he's the manager of a hotel restaurant, so it's a very busy time for him. He's irate that Tina is interrupting him at work with more of the ghost stuff. He tells her it's all her imagination, that she's frightening Karen, and it has to stop. The ridiculousness has to stop. A few days later, Frank takes the day off, and they all go out together as a family taking a pleasant trip and drive about. It's December, and they go Christmas shopping and then have dinner at a nice restaurant, a wonderful day and evening. But as they pull up to the house, the girls giggling away, Frank humming along to Phil Collins on the radio, Tina notices that all the lights in the house are on and an icy shiver of fear runs down her spine. Dad, All the lights are on. We didn't leave the lights on. It was daylight when we left. Something is going on. Frank doesn't know what to make of it. Whatever's going on, though, he's determined to find out right now. And he marches up to his house and swings open the door. The girls, terrified to be alone, follow closely behind in a huddle. 
Every radio, television, and electrical device in the house was turned on. Frank goes room to room. Looking in the bathroom, he sees the toilet has been used and not flushed. He notices his bedroom door is ajar and stomps in, the girls still behind him. He swings open the closet door, looks inside, and says, Oh, hello there. I'll, I'll, I'll just let you be. And shuts the door. The girls think he's joking, messing with them. A bad dad joke, and it's such a crazy time. But when he turns to face them, his eyes wide in terror, suddenly mouthing, go, 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 and waving them into the hall, they realize something is not right. And then the closet door swings open, and out steps a creature from a nightmare. Its face is smeared and caked with makeup, making it look like some sort of goblin. Its unkempt hair piled with gels and spiked out, draped in an old fur coat of Tina's mom's. In one hand, the creature clutches a pipe wrench. In the other, a hatchet. As Frank herds the girls towards a back room, he calmly tries to talk to the figure. Hi! Take what you like. It's just a homeless man, girls. Just a homeless man, hungry, looking for a little food, nothing to worry about. He's just going to get some food and be on his way. But the figure, appearing more animal than man in the fur coat, face unrecognizable under layers of makeup, hair like that of a diseased and rabid forest creature, raises the hatchet and, growling, comes at them, lips twisting up to expose rotten, clenched teeth. Frank pushes the girls into the room, darting in behind them, and slams the door shut, twisting the flimsy lock on the doorknob as it begins to rattle and shake, the creature banging on the door. Tina runs to a small window, manages to pry it open. They're on the second floor, and it's a far drop. But if she can shimmy far enough down the rain gutter, she'll be fine. I'm going for help! She shouts to them as she summons her courage and bravely squeezes through the window, slipping down the gutter and dropping to the front lawn below, racing out into the night to the neighbors for help. The police quickly rush to the scene and enter the house to find nothing. No intruder, no animal-like man in a fur coat and painted face. They cover the house from top to bottom even run a canine unit through it. Whoever it was, was gone. Disappeared without a trace. The girls are obviously much too frightened to go back to the house that night. And Frank doesn't want to go back either. In fact, Frank decides right then he wants to sell the damn house. It had too many memories as it was. They pack up some clothes and essentials and go to a hotel room and try to digest as a family what has happened. Tina telling them how terrified she was that something dreadful had happened while she was racing to the neighbors. After a couple days, they decide to return to the house just to grab some things. No way were they staying there with that maniac on the loose. In fact, they were so freaked out by everything that they called the cops and asked them to escort them to the house while they ran inside and grabbed their things. So Officer Stephen Besenson was sent to escort Frank and three girls back to the suburban home on 93 Lawrence Street. As they pulled up to the house, all of them looked up to the second floor living room window to see a figure there, happily waving hello to them. Hi, everybody! Officer Besenson drew his weapon and stealthily entered the home, swinging open the door to see a family portrait stabbed to the wall with a butcher knife. The message, I'm still here, come find me, scrawled on it in magic marker. Gazing up the staircase, he saw another family photograph stabbed to the wall with a knife. On this one was written, I'll kill you all. Officer Besenson secured the scene and called for backup. Chief David Young and Sergeant Jim Scott quickly arriving to the scene. All three officers searched the house once again. And again, they couldn't find any intruder. It had been snowing, and there were no footprints leading to or from the house in the snow. So the perpetrator had to still be there. 
a whole contingent of police descended, searching everywhere. In the cellar, an officer hoisted himself up over a four-foot foundation wall and squeezed into a nine-inch opening, wiggled up, then dropped down into a tiny triangular space used to house plumbing. From this little area, it was also possible to slide upward into some of the walls, including Tina's bedroom. In the far corner of the small space was a bundle of clothing. It took a moment for the officer to realize the crumpled ball of clothes was actually a person trying to hide by piling dirty laundry on themselves. The officer crept up to the bundle of clothing, seeing what was obviously a crouched person, and pressed the barrel of his revolver against their head, saying, Let me see those hands or I'm going to splatter your brains all over these walls. The officer would later say that it was then he realized he was dealing with a dangerous, dangerous person. For the intruder didn't act nervous at all, just glanced at him and smiled. That person was 17-year-old Daniel LaPlante. And Tina would realize with terror that she actually knew him. He was this guy who called her randomly and said he'd gotten the number from a friend of hers. Tina hadn't really thought anything of the phone call at the time. She gave out her number freely, like we've said earlier. These are the days before the internet, before social media, when the only form of communication was the landline phone. Everyone talked on the phone. If you were the cool kid, you had your own separate phone line that your parents had put in for you with your own private phone in your room. And all the kids would babble, thrilling over being able to put their friends on hold to talk to their other friends. So Tina had talked to the boy. He seemed pretty cool, said he was from Townsend, the next town over, and knew a lot of her friends. He said he was on the football team and popular. They talked for months. In some accounts that you read, they'll say that he was fixated on the death of her mother and would ask her all kinds of morbid questions, like how long it had taken, how much weight did she lose, what did she look like when she died that Daniel had this obsession with both Tina's mother and death in general. And there's also these other accounts that you'll read where he asked Tina to a date to the state fair and she accepts and then rejects him under the flashing lights and swishing rides. And, and I love that. It's the whole carnival aspect. Carnivals obviously add depth and character to any story. <laughs> but the whole fair carnival stuff is not true. They were never in the shadows of the zipper, eating popcorn together after riding through the haunted castle. Instead, Tina says in an interview I watched that she was at a community event and he just walked up to her and introduced himself, saying he was Daniel, the guy from Townsend, who'd, who'd she been talking to on the phone. She says he seemed perfectly nice, but that she thought he was kind of ugly and gross. He was really greasy and covered in pimples. His clothes were dirty and he smelled. And remember, Tina, you know, bless her little 80s heart, is in her pink Ray-Ban sunglasses and white as snow baggy Benetton shirt. She was all about being super clean and looking good. Despite what they say in the breakfast club, the criminal and the prom queen simply weren't going to hook up. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly as I see them. He's like so Judd Nelson. And she is so Molly Ringwald that they even look like those characters in real life. So she basically ghosted him. Daniel called her a few more times, but she just shrugged him off, said she couldn't talk. And eventually he stopped calling. She soon forgot all about it. Just some weird guy that had gotten her phone number. Little did she know, Daniel LaPlante was becoming so obsessed with her and her dead mother that he was living in the walls outside of her bedroom, dressed in her dead mother's fur coat, his face smeared with her makeup, with a hatchet spying on her as she slept through the electrical outlet holes. Yes, investigators found where he had loosened the electric outlets in Tina's room so that when he was inside of her wall, he could slip the outlets out and look in through the holes. This is some real crazy horror movie shit going on. And it just gets worse. 
much, much worse, unfortunately, for Daniel LaPlante was a very disturbed individual. And this is only the beginning of our story. Ladies and gentlemen, Act Two, Daniel and the Forest. Daniel J. LaPlante was born on May 15th, 1970. He grew up on Elm Street in Townsend, Massachusetts, to what he describes as an utterly horrible existence. The house he grew up in is a house known for having broken down cars and trash filling the yard. A house described in the Boston Globe as a place more suited for barnyard animals than humans. He had a whole mess of other brothers and sisters and was apparently neglected. As just a small child, he was said to have been unkempt, unclean, wearing tattered clothes, the other children all saying he smelled bad and was dirty. Worse, he was dyslexic and struggled to learn how to read. A neighbor, Jill Gary, who ran a little farm down the street, says, That boy was a troublemaker from day one. When he was six years old, my husband and I paid him to pick rocks and stones from the field. And instead, the little kid just went and smashed all of our pumpkins. It was just the beginning of a bad reputation. He was quickly accused of being a thief as well. Daniel claims his entire life was a string of horrible abuse. He says he was first sexually molested by his own father, that it lasted years. Then, when his mother remarried, his stepfather molested him as well. He acted out, got in trouble, loved to steal. He was referred to a psychiatrist who diagnosed him with hyperactivity disorder. And when Daniel confessed to the psychiatrist that he'd been molested by both his father and his stepfather, the psychiatrist molested him as well. Daniel most likely started breaking into homes at a very young age. His house backed up into a forest, and he would disappear into there. As a small child, it was just a place to play, to get away from the horror of his life, to lose himself. As he got older, he began to explore the forest more and more. Darlene Mahoney, who lived across the street, says, You'd see him walk out there by himself. That's the only place you'd see him, the woods. From the forest, he could access all kinds of areas throughout Townsend and far beyond, to Old City and Townsend Harbor, even out to Pepperell, which was about six miles away, following utility lines or drainage ditches, fire roads through new subdivisions and older suburbs. He'd practically live in that forest, spending all his time there sneaking around, spying, watching people, peeking in through their windows, watching when they were awake, when they went to work, when they came home, when they were on vacation. He learned the ways to sneak in unnoticed, look for a key under a rock or mat, find an unlocked basement window with no screen. He could come in, make himself some food, root around a little and sneak back out. And most of the time, no one even noticed. Sometimes he'd do little pranks, like move the furniture around. After elementary school in Townsend, Daniel attended St. Bernard's High School in Fitchburg, lasting from September 1985 until June 1986. At St. Bernard's, he played football, ran track, and got mostly C's. Students remembered him as a loner who never made any effort to make friends or congregate with others never went to any parties, happy instead to lurk in the shadows of the forest, spying on people, breaking into houses. But as he became an adolescent, and those teenage hormones kicked in, he grew bolder and bolder, taking valuables, getting sloppy, getting caught more than once, racking up a juvenile rap sheet. And then these kids told him about this pretty girl they'd seen dancing like Madonna in the window of a laundromat. And the girl had given them her number. Daniel asked if he could have the number as well, and the kids gave it to him. That girl, obviously, was Tina Bowen. Daniel boldly called Tina on the phone, and she talked to him, was nice to him. But Tina was Tina, a self-admitted boy-crazy 80s teenager 
when she actually met him in person, she saw he had no sense of fashion, was dirty, greasy, and in her opinion, ugly. And she gently set him aside and moved on. But Daniel never moved on. He figured out where she lived. She was in neighboring Pepperell, six miles away in a secluded, wooded suburban house. Daniel started stalking her, studying her and her family, breaking into her house, living in her walls, pretending to be her dead mother when Tina held a seance. He literally haunted her, then terrorized her, made her life a living hell, turned her father against her and made her question her own sanity, tearing open wounds of grief along the way. And then, from what it appears, prepared to kill her and her entire family. After being apprehended in the walls of the house, he was charged with breaking and entering, kidnapping, and threatening bodily harm. Uh, I guess impersonating a ghost isn't a crime, in, in Massachusetts at least. After his arrest for the incident at the Bowen home, LaPlante was held in a State Department of Youth Services detention facility from January until October. When LaPlante's case was transferred from a juvenile court to Lowell Superior Court, he was held in lieu of a $10,000 bail. LaPlante's mother, Elaine Moore, remortgaged their house to get the bail money, and Daniel LaPlante walked out of jail to await his trial. When the press reported that Daniel LaPlante was free on bail, Frank immediately rounded up his girls and went into hiding, actually quitting his job so that he could guard them. Out on bail, Daniel immediately started breaking into houses again, stealing cash and valuables, and most alarmingly, guns. Five houses in the local area were broken into, and among the items stolen was a twenty-two pistol as well as a rifle. Supposedly, Daniel's stepfather found the pistol and confronted Daniel over it, demanding to know where he'd gotten it. But Daniel told him it was an old gun he'd had long before he'd gone to jail, and his stepfather let him keep it. Brilliant move. They're like, yes, I don't know. Uh, one of the houses he broke into was the Gustafsson house which was right through the woods behind his house. Among the items he stole from the Gustafsons was a cordless phone, cable boxes, and remotes, leading some investigators to speculate he may have been intending to do another haunting, living in their walls and terrorizing them. The Gustafsons were a married couple. Andrew was a young lawyer, and Priscilla was a nursery school teacher with two children and another on the way. Priscilla Gustafsson was four months pregnant. Daniel needed bullets for his pistol and asked his brother and his brother's friend for some ammunition. When they asked him what he wanted the bullets for, he supposedly told them he wanted to melt down lead for an experiment. I don't know, that sounds weird, but apparently it was a family of juvenile delinquency and crime, so the brothers got him the bullets he wanted. Never mind that he's out on bail for kidnapping and attempted murder. Daniel LaPlante now had a loaded gun. On December 1st, 1987, Daniel went back to the Gustafsons. And I can't help but think, so it's almost a year exactly since he had his last completely psychotic breakdown at the Bowens house. And it's like all the Christmas decorations, the lights, the snow, the trees all lit up in people's windows. I wonder if that's like some kind of trigger for him. I don't know. Yeah, and Daniel claims he just wanted to break into the house and rearrange the furniture to freak the family out. But just this statement shows what a hatred of families he has, happy suburban families. He stabbed the Bowen family portraits and wrote, I'll kill you all on them in magic marker. I mean, come on. Yeah, talk about a red flag. It's, it's crazy, right? <sighs> so Daniel LaPlante says he was surprised that December day. When the door swung open and pregnant nursery school teacher Priscilla Gustafsson and her five-year-old son William walked in the door and saw him standing in their house. Ladies and gentlemen, Act 3, The Perfect American Family. The Gustafsons had bought their house in Townsend just five years earlier with the arrival of their second child, William. 
Their daughter, Abigail, would have been two at the time. Another baby, bigger house. And they loved their house, a colonial with a tastefully rustic look, set back down a long lane and nestled in the forest where the children could play. Room for the kids to roam out, and they needed room because Priscilla was four months pregnant, and they were delighted to be adding another child to their happy brood. They had everything going for them. They were smart, upwardly mobile, beautiful. They were the perfect American family. Priscilla had always wanted a big family and was so great with children. She worked as a nursery school teacher and just had a way with kids. At seven, Abigail was the perfect little girl, smart and sweet, responsible enough to get on the bus and take it home from school all on her own. Five-year-old William was just a cherub of a child, like a little angel. Dad Andrew was a young country lawyer, but a businessman as well, working in real estate. And the real estate market was booming. Suburbs and subdivisions popping up all over, the local economy thriving. Andrew had worked hard his whole life, and everything was paying off. He just closed a big real estate deal that afternoon and was ecstatic as he drove down the lane to tell his wife, excited at the thought of the children's happy screams of daddy, thinking how great it was going to be to soon have another child's voice in the mix. He was in the mood to celebrate. But instead, Andrew would come home to a dead, quiet house and a scene of horror worse than anything he could have ever imagined. All the time the happy family had been living down the country lane in their dream home, little could they have known that the forest their house was nestled in was the playground of a deranged psychopath. Priscilla had taught nursery school class that morning, then went and picked up little four-year-old William from the babysitter and headed home to wait for Abigail to get back on the school bus. When she opened the door to her house, Daniel LaPlante was there. Daniel claims she surprised him, but he'd been stalking her for days, knew her schedule inside and out, and knew exactly who came home, when and how. He flashed a gun at the terrified Priscilla, who told him to just take whatever he wanted, but not to hurt William. He marched them both upstairs into the master bedroom, shoved William into the closet, then bound Priscilla to the bed with stockings. Daniel then sexually assaulted the pregnant mother of two. When he was finished, he put a pillow over her face and shot the preschool teacher in the head, killing her instantly. Daniel then went to the closet, grabbed five-year-old William, and dragged him into the bathroom. He put a stopper in the tub and dragged him into the bathroom. He put a stopper in the tub, cranked on the spigot. When the tub was nearly full, he grabbed the hysterical five-year-old and pulled him into the bathtub, gripping his hair and shoving his head under the icy water, holding the child there until he struggled no more. Daniel then calmly sat in that house of rape and death and waited, waited patiently for seven-year-old Abigail to come on in off the bus. He'd been stalking the family. He knew exactly what time the little girl would get home. He later confessed as much to investigators. When Abigail walked in the door, Daniel was waiting for her. He marched her into the downstairs bathroom, where he grabbed her by the hair and forced her head under the bathwater until she drowned to death. Then Daniel fled out into the night and forest of his childhood and dreams. And this is the house that Andrew Gustafsson came home to that cold night of December 1st, 1987. Act 4. The Manhunt. After raping pregnant Priscilla Gustafsson, shooting her in the head, and drowning her two children, Daniel headed back to his house and was soon whisked away to Fitchburg for a birthday party for his niece at his brother-in-law Leo's house. His niece turned six years old that day. Daniel ate birthday cake, 
smiling, seeming without a care in the world. He played with his niece, wrestling around with her and tickling her. His relatives would later be baffled by it all. How could he have just drowned an innocent five and seven-year-old hours earlier and then be playing joyfully with his niece? Officer George Aho from the Lunenburg, Massachusetts Police Department was the first officer to arrive at the Gustafsson house. He found the children in the two separate bathtubs. He said William was lying face down in a nearly empty tub while Abigail was in a full tub and looked like she'd put up a fight and struggled. Police dogs led investigators a mile through the woods, right to the back door of Daniel LaPlante's mother's house, the very one she'd mortgaged to pay his bail money. Along the way, they found a nameplate with Gustafsson engraved on it that had been taken from the house, bundled in a flannel shirt with a pair of work gloves, that tested positive for gunshot residue. At the residence, they found the gun used to kill Priscilla and other items stolen from the Gustafsons, but no Danny. He'd heard them coming and had bolted out into those woods. The killer was on the loose. A warrant was issued for LaPlante for the triple murder of Priscilla Gustafson and her two young children on December 3rd, 1987, and a perimeter was set up around the large wooded area LaPlante was believed to be lurking in. Police were patrolling the area in force, prowling through the forests and backyards, the maze of drainage ditches. It was a full-on manhunt. Lynn McGovern was just coming home from work in the area when she saw a police cruiser parked by her driveway. Nervous about all the goings-on, she strolled up to the policeman in the cruiser and asked if he would mind escorting her into her house, just to be on the safe side. The officer was torn for a moment. Leaving that spot just for a minute could compromise the perimeter containment. But he couldn't refuse a citizen asking for protection, so he escorted Lynn into her house and quickly started to give it a once-over. As he says in his own words, A loud noise upstairs alerted me, and I drew my sidearm and started climbing the stairs. Oddly, although I was mentally riveted on getting to the source of the noise, my mind asked the question, Did I clean this gun lately? Funny how your mind works under stress. At the top of the landing was a 16-gauge shotgun lying flat on the floor. Mrs. McGovern started to scream loudly when I announced my find. Daniel had been watching out the window the whole time, wanting to take Lynn McGovern hostage. But when he saw the policeman enter, he panicked and was able to jump out of the second floor window onto the garage roof and run into the woods, still armed with a revolver and a high-powered rifle. Daniel then ran through the woods to another house, this one on 17 Elm Street slipping inside, undetected. He sat in the home patiently, waiting until the owner, Pam McKella, got home. Meanwhile, the media were absolutely going crazy. The whole town was on alert. Daniel had thrown the entire area into a crazy panic. The press gathered at a local lumber yard where Daniel was mistakenly thought to be, and the cops were freaking out that he was going to take one of the reporters hostage or even shoot one of them on live television. And meanwhile, over on Elm Street, Pam McKella returned home to Daniel, pointing a gun at her. He told her he needed her to drive him out of the area because he couldn't do it. He only had a learner's permit. What the hell? Like... (laughs) So weird. He's worried about driving with just a learner's permit, yet he's murdering people. Yeah. And apparently it gets even weirder because Pam McKellar's vehicle, it was a bright orange van with a pop top and two for sale signs on the side. And they piled in. And as they drove past City Hall, Pam slowed the van down to a crawl and actually leapt out a frazzled and frustrated Danny having to jump into the driver's seat and take over the wheel, despite only having just a learner's permit. Pam took off, went running down the road, screaming her head off, and soon authorities were told to be on the lookout for a bright orange van with a pop top and two huge for sale signs on the side. And it was quickly spotted. 
Imagine that. When Daniel realized he was being tailed, he ditched the van and headed off on foot. Police had the entire area tightly cordoned off, and eventually, Littleton officers Scott Como and Paul Barada found him hiding in a dumpster. The manhunt for Daniel LePan had lasted for 48 hours and was now over. Act 4. The Aftermath. Following LePan's arrest, Frank Bowen came out of hiding and made a statement to the Lowell Sun newspaper, saying, if Daniel LaPlante does not get convicted and gets out again, I will personally kill him. You can't imagine what kind of fear we have been living in. He is mentally insane. There is no question about it. And now I, I'm financially broke and emotionally disturbed and just trying to put my life together again. Many citizens of Massachusetts and beyond were rightfully irate that Daniel had been released on bond when he was obviously so dangerous, delusional, and psychotic. I mean, yeah, he chased a family around with a hatchet and then wrote, I'll kill you on their family portrait and stabbed it to the wall. What kind of fucking red flag do these people need? He'd been in and out of jail since he was a little kid, each crime escalating and just getting worse and worse. Following a trial in 1988, LaPlante was convicted of all three murders in the Gustafsson family slayings and sentenced to life in prison in the Massachusetts Correctional Institution, Norfolk. In 2017, LaPlante sought to be released from prison after a Massachusetts law went into effect that stated juveniles sentenced to life in prison should be given the opportunity to re-enter society. During his resentencing, LaPlante apologized for his actions and asked for a second chance, saying, Words cannot fully capture what I have done. I murdered three innocent people. I do not have the words to fully express my profound sorrow, but I am truly sorry for the harm I have caused. From the very essence of who I am, from the depth of my soul, I am sorry. Yeah, sure he is. And he conveniently forgot that he killed four innocent people as Priscilla was pregnant. Following a psychiatric evaluation, psychiatrist Fabian Saleh said that LaPlante showed, quote, no empathy, end quote, and, quote, continued to minimize his behaviors, end quote. Priscilla's sister, Christine Morgan, testified that her sister wouldn't want LaPlante to see the light of day. Additionally, Andrew Gustafsson's second wife, Carol Gustafsson, said that Andrew was plagued by nightmares of his family's murder until he died from cancer in 2014. Do not let this man out, Carol said. He should rot in prison. Yeah, yeah I was just struck by this. Continued to minimize his behaviors. I mean, how do you minimize murder? Murdering two children and a pregnant woman. It's just fucking crazy. Yeah, that's... Uh, a judge subsequently sentenced him to 45 years in prison. Then in 2019, a separate law went into effect, allowing juveniles convicted of murder to ask for parole after they've served at least 30 years. Who the hell is making these laws? Like, <laughs> The law stated that judges are given the discretion to reduce sentences. However, a Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court upheld the previous judge's ruling. Thank you. <laughs> right. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of Daniel LaPlante, a ghost within the walls. Scary. Very scary. And we're going to go right to the heart of scary next week with a deep dive into one of the most terrifying serial killers that's ever lived. We're going to get down and dirty with new DNA findings, new research, and some of our own investigations. Thank you so much for listening, dear listeners and fellow freaks. We'll be back next week with more tales of murder and mayhem right here on Murder Coaster. And you know we want to hear from you. You got a case you think we should cover? Did we get something wrong? Do you just want to say hi? Drop us a line at murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. That's murdercoasterpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. <laughs>